conversation as usual, global geopolitical conversation, but this time we're gonna touch on technology and expectations and how do we think things can get fixed. Last uh, summit we had in Abu Dhabi was uh, under the theme, thinking 2020s, what to expect, how to prepare. And little we knew uh, what to expect and how to prepare. So a year later, here we are uh, thinking about it, trying to see where to go. And if that's not about lessons learned because it's really about the new decade and how do we deal with it. So with that, I want to uh, welcome uh, the first speaker, four minutes will go to him, Tom Fletcher, and then we'll uh, listen to Vance Serchuk, and then we go to, uh, to uh, Asna Aydin Tashbash, and then to Karim Sajakfour. Four minutes to each, then we engage in a great conversation, and I know everyone is going to enjoy it. Tom Fletcher, to you. Four minutes, please. Thank you so much, Heidi, and it's, uh, it's fantastic um, uh, that you brought together for, you know, to really step back and think about uh, what's coming at us uh, in the coming uh, decade, because it's a reminder that in just a few weeks, we'll be stepping, blinking out it back into the sunlight of a post-COVID, post-Trump uh, reality. And as Bill Burns has been saying about the world, uh, the world that America is coming back into is not the world that America left. So I want to start on a pessimistic note, but end on an optimistic one. Uh, the pessimistic note is that when you look around at the scorched earth, uh, that we'll be coming back onto uh, in 2021. What do you see? You see that a pandemic that showed us how much we had in common actually led us to uh, very nationalist uh, solutions. You see uh, a Europe which can be characterized as decadent, a US which is divided, a Russia which is disruptive, and a China which is disengaged. And at that stage, everything is in motion. The biggest threat to Europe is not losing my country, the UK, but is actually losing Merkel in the coming years. The biggest threat to the US is not an erratic Trump weaponizing inequality using social media, but an organized Trump in the future weaponizing social media and inequality. The threat to Russia is not what happens if it gains power too fast, but what happens if it continues to lose power uh, too fast. And the threat to China is not that it grows too slowly, uh, but that it grows too fast. So what happened, what do we do in that context? Well, I, um, I would argue this is a moment for a decade of diplomacy, a decade of extraordinary diplomacy. And I don't mean traditional diplomacy, the sort of maps and chaps, Congress of Vienna, Ferrero Rocher uh, diplomacy that has failed so much in the 21st century that brought us Syria and failure to resolve Israel-Palestine that has led many uh, out beyond diplomacy to replace diplomats. Uh, with their own forms of uh, diplomacy. I mean, a more Darwinian form of diplomacy that evolves, adapts to new technology. Someone once said, uh, you know, when they saw the telegram, my God, it's the end of diplomacy. When they saw the fax machine, someone said you can replace the foreign ministry uh, with the fax. I want to see the kind of diplomacy which will see off uh, all these forms of technology and, and show that it can outlive them. I will come back later on in more detail, if you like, um, to how we can do that. Practically, but just for now, the six areas that I think uh, will generate Nobel Peace Prizes in the 2020s. I hope one, uh, who's going to who's going to build these post-COVID climate change accords that we need. Two, who's going to establish the new grand bargain for the Middle East based on genuine security, justice, opportunity, based on countries uh, like Israel and and Saudi having an America that is working in their in, in actually in their interests and not necessarily in the interests of individual uh, leaders uh, that will have a US going back in the Middle East to putting out fires, not starting them. Third Nobel Prize will go to the person who revives the international institutions, gouty, stagnant, orphaned international architecture out there. We need to rebuild that for the 21st century. Fourth one, who's going to do the peace process between government and technology, particularly big tech? Who gives AI the, eth the right uh, ethics in the future? How do we manage lethal autonomous weapon systems, etc.? Fifth one, really vital one, how do we equip more people to win from globalization and technological change and better protect the, those who are left uh, behind? And a sixth one, who is gonna do the quiet, patient, behind the scenes work to mediate between the US and China as they rub up against each other in the 2020s? You know, Trump replaced the shining city on a hill with a tacky gold uh, tower. 
Um, but now that America has basically withdrawn its resignation as the greatest force for liberty ever, I think there's a real opportunity for us to, to rebuild global stability. Uh, if diplomacy didn't exist, we would need to invent it, but now we'll need to reinvent it uh, for the post-COVID age. Very good, excellent. I want to put the question, the last point back at you, uh, to you. Uh, who, you said, you know, the quiet, potentially, the quiet diplomacy behind the scenes between the US and China. Do you have a nomination for that? So I have a theory that much of the best diplomacy will be done in the 2020s, not by the traditional diplomatic powerhouses, um, several of which have caused to be slightly humble by their by the handling of this uh, pandemic. Many countries that projected this sense of kind of confidence and competence, AAA rating for getting stuff done, are not looking quite as good as we go into 2021 as they were looking or claimed to be looking a decade ago. So I think much of that diplomacy will be done by smaller, more agile countries that have actually come through the pandemic very well. You might think of New Zealand, you might think of Vietnam, you might think of uh, Singapore or Jordan, but some of those less traditional diplomatic actors will, be, will become more important in the 2020s. Fascinating. Okay, we're going to talk about that in, at length in, in a little bit after we listen to Vance Sergic. Thank you very much, Tom Fletcher. Uh, Vance Sergic, to you, four minutes, please. Thanks so much, Regina. It's uh, also a pleasure and a privilege to be here with, um, with such a distinguished group of, of fellow panelists. You know, as I sort of reflect on um, looking towards the, the 2020s and into the future, I think that as we um, also reflect on the experience of just the past several months and the pandemic, uh, it should begin with a certain sense of, of modesty. Um, you know, what uh, former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates said of the United States and our ability to predict the next war, we have an absolutely perfect track record. We get it wrong every single time. Much in the same way, our track record of predicting what the next big crisis is has also been, uh, shall we say, um, modest at best. Um, and so I think the one thing that we can say with absolute certainty as we look ahead um, is that we will be surprised um, once again um, by where crises come from, from how they manifest themselves. Um, and so, you know, begin with a, a sense of, of measured modesty about uh, the world as uh, despite all of our expertise, despite all of our time and energy and effort trying to master it, um, things happen that tend to uh, not be the things that you expect. As I step back though, um, when I, I think about the 2020s, and I think Tom really did a spectacular job of laying out so many of the, the different regional and thematic challenges that we face. To me, one of the biggest overarching challenges um, that we face on a, on a, really on a planetary scale is that we're at a moment in history when our technological ingenuity is at risk of outstripping our strategic and moral imagination. Um, and what we see is within the, the context of what has uh, been labeled great power competition, whether it's with respect to cyber, artificial intelligence, uh, biotechnology, robotics, um, all of the, the, the major powers are increasingly investing in uh, and trying to weaponize these transformational new technologies. Uh, there are multiple arms races that are now underway. Uh, at the same time, however, when you, when you step back and ask, okay, well, what would a conflict um, using these technologies actually look like if it were to happen at scale? The answer is, we don't know. Um, and, and that's a very, very scary thing when you, when you think about it. What would a cyber war at scale look like? We don't know. What would a conflict where these other uh, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, what would it look like? We just don't know. Um, this really stands in contrast when you think about the Cold War. As terrifying as nuclear weapons were and are, it didn't take any great leap of imagination in the 1950s or 1960s to conceive of what a nuclear conflict would look like because we had seen Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Also, the nature of nuclear weapons was such that over time they did lend themselves to a kind of arms control. In a bilateral uh, system, a bipolar system, um, you know, a nuclear exchange was uh, uh, easy to attribute and you had the, the principle of mutually assured destruction. By contrast, when you think about these new technologies that are emerging, cyber, AI, robotics, space, they are in many cases harder to trace, uh, harder to attribute, and uh, therefore uh, uh, harder to control, less susceptible to arms control, and also more tempting to use. 
uh, they also are increasingly more proliferated. Um, so that it's not just a question of a monopoly by one or two or three countries, but the risk of far more players being in the system. The great danger I think that we face is that the analogy, uh, as we think about the early 20th century, late 19th century, another period when there is remarkable technological change, remarkable progress for humanity, but those extraordinary advances as they weaponized fell into a system which ultimately when it, they were unleashed in World War I resulted in the destruction of the civilization, European civilization itself. The great challenge for us is how do we avoid repeating that fate? How do we take advantage of these great technological advances? Uh, and that in turn goes back, I think, to where Tom began, which is the need for not just technological ingenuity, but statecraft, diplomacy, mm -hmm. and moral imagination. And so, Vance Zerchuk, uh, is this going to be the responsibility of the public sphere only or the private sphere equally? I, I see that there has been an encroachment by the big, uh, the big companies, the huge companies, the, from Silicon Valley to the military industries to space, uh, et cetera. This is where I, I'm a little bit unclear if it is only public responsibility, governmental. Is that? Do we have anything that's regularizing, that, that is reassuring that there will be somebody putting laws to curb them? Yeah, so there's no question that um, government ultimately, because of the extraordinary uh, power that, that the government has, has to be the key actor here in my mind. But to your point, Regita, one of the reasons that this moment is so challenging is that the technological ingenuity is not taking place from inside government, it's much of it's taking place outside of government. And so you're right that there needs to be a much more robust dialogue uh, between government and the private sector in order to understand where technology is going and to be able to think through how it is that we're going to manage and regulate it. Part of the other challenge though is also precisely because these, these developments are taking place outside of government, the question of how you apply principles of arms control become also much more challenging. All right. Thank you very much, Ivan Sershuk. Eventually, we're going to be talking about uh, other advanced sort of the, the advancement of local or regional uh, military uh, through through as simple matters as the missiles, for example, of precision. I'm sure uh, Kanim Sajapur is going to be talking to us about that eventually. But for now, I'm going to go to Asla Aydin Tashbash in Istanbul. And uh, uh, four minutes to you, Asla. Thank you, Ragida. Um, well, I'm going to bring the discussion on a much more, much more narrow topic, which is Turkey, from the big ideas down to the country where I'm coming from. To be honest with you, I'm really not joining the school. The, 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 this is not the same country that that it was four years ago, five years ago. It is clearly more of a resurgent power uh, that feels it is time, that it's the, now the time for uh, sort of the rise of a Turkish state in the region that feels more self-confident and is interested in uh, having a military footprint outside of its borders. Uh, that's all fine, but I think the pro I, I have to say I'm a little bit nostalgic for a country which had a reform agenda, which had uh, a, a very strong and, and admirable uh, secular democracy and a policy which was zero problems with neighbors. I think I am quite nostalgic also about Turkish soft power in the region. While uh, military hard power is all fine and uh, we can discuss uh, the Turkey's uh, entry into some of the regional conflicts and we can discuss whether or not there is some type of a European vacuum or, or US retrenchment in this region. I think these are all true, but nonetheless, let us not think of power is in 19th century terms, which is what we seem to be doing right now in Turkey, as in controlling of various towns here and there. Power is something entirely different in 21st century. What power is, is being able to invent, have, contribute to that vaccine that is helping us fight coronavirus, that's being able to fight that one innovation that is going to help us bring green energy back into the, our part of the world. So again, uh, I want to think of power in 21st century 
in, in different terms and not only in terms of hard power. I also want to, uh, to co go back to a situa situation in which normalization with our neighbors, in particular, uh, zero problems with our neighbors would be a prospect for future. Uh, and I think that Turkey's soft power as a democracy has always been important it has not it's not so relevant today but i think that is where its strength where, where its strength lies so these are some of the topics that i really want to revisit when i think of the news uh, you know the the, the, the coming age uh, particularly now that there is a change of government in the us one other uh, one other topic, which is very important, of course, we're seeing, we're reading a lot about the fault lines in the Middle East, the new fault lines that affect Turkey with Turkey on one side and all, and how these fault lines are seeping into Eastern Mediterranean, Syria, Libya and all. But what we're not talking about is the prospect of a green deal in the Middle East, Eastern Mediterranean, the whole fight is about who is going to dig where, who is going to dig hydrocarbons where, who is going to build these expensive, possibly unachievable uh, pipelines underwater. And no one is really focusing on regional cooperation to deal with issues that affect us all from war. And at the heart of many of these issues is the environmental disaster, the climate disaster that our part of the world is facing. Thank you very much. I want to ask you about uh, the notion that dream that I think it was David, uh, David uh, Uglu, your former foreign minister, who had this idea of zero problems with neighbors. Well, it turned out to be uh, quite a number of problems with neighbors, in particular in Syria, in particular. In fact, things were going very well at one point with Israel. And now look who's really doing well with Israel. It's the Arab states, not Turkey, as it used to be. So you, you think uh, this is going to... I mean, first of all, tell me how do people in Turkey feel about that? I don't think Syria policy is seen as a success. At the end of the day, yes, Turkey is controlling a stretch of territory, but in the opinion polls that I have seen, by and large, people consider it uh, that, that you know Turkey is paying too big a price. That the you know the situation with the refugees and and the, uh, and the situation inside the country, there's no resolution. And I think that there is, by and large, a desire to see an end to the conflict, a resolution to the conflict. So uh, yes, Syria is an important component and one of the areas where the idea of zero problems with, with, uh, with, with neighbors has collapsed. Of course, Turkey is not uh, responsible for what happened in Syria, and, but it has not facilitated, it has not helped bring about a resolution to the conflict either. And I think in the next phase, we all have to think of what to do in terms of both in, on the humanitarian side, but it also in terms of reconstruction and a resolution to the conflict. There already is a process under the UN, it's not moving anywhere, but the countries around Syria and Syrians themselves really want really expect more from us. Yeah, we will talk about Syria because that's important. I want, we, I want to discuss also the relationship between the uh, president of Turkey, Rajat Tayyip Erdogan, and the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. Uh, how did it, uh, um, um, no, what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh? Is it going to have uh, an echo in Syria, uh, in Idlib? We'll talk about that when we engage in the conversation. Keep the thought, though. Uh, I want to go to Karim Sajadpour. And uh, Karim, I know you have things to say on your own, but uh, just at one point, eventually, when you finish with your four minutes, I want to draw back on what Asla said uh, regarding uh, Turkey having uh, its military outside its own borders, which is sort of the signature of the regime in Tehran. So I. Just if I forget to go there, you guys take me back. Karim Sajapur, I have four minutes for you, please. Go ahead. Thank you, Ravida. It's wonderful to be with all of you. Uh, I think what I'd like to talk about in my four minutes are the short-term and long-term decisions which both uh, uh, the Iranian government has to make and the short and long-term uh, decisions which the United States government will have to make vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Um, in Tehran at the moment, in the immediate term, the big decision they're going to have to make 
is do they restore their economy or do they try to restore uh, deterrence and national pride in the aftermath of the assassination of their top nuclear scientists? It's going to be very difficult to do both of those things because their economic malaise cannot be reversed absent either a full or partial return to the Iran nuclear deal and the removal of sanctions. But if they try to avenge the death of the nuclear scientists, they could well sabotage that possibility of going back to the Iran nuclear deal. So that's the near-term decision they have to make. The long-term decision that Iran is going to have to make is very similar to the decision that both the Soviet Union and the Chinese government had to make in the 1970s. And that is, do they prioritize the revolutionary ideology first, or do they prioritize the economic and national interests of the country? The Soviet Union doubled down essentially on revolutionary ideology, and we know how that story ended. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese in the 1970s decided to put uh, their economic interests before revolutionary ideology, and they're still around. My, my view is that the Islamic Republic of Iran is going to be incapable of following the China model, and right. they'll likely end up with the Soviet model. But as we know, that malaise can continue for a decade or two um, with uh, significant repression. So now what are the short-term and long-term decisions that the US government has to make vis-a-vis -vis Iran? Mm -hmm. In the immediate term, the Biden administration is going to have to decide how it sequences its Iran policy. What that means is do they first return to the Iran nuclear deal and then try to address uh, other problematic Iranian policies, whether that's Iran's malign regional policies, its missile program, its domestic behavior, or does the Biden administration first uh, essentially look at those other policies in the broader package before returning to the nuclear deal? I think that they've already made that decision. Their instinct is to first return to the nuclear deal and mm -hmm. then address those other issues. Um, but either way, those other issues are going to have to be addressed. Finally, the more medium and longer term challenge of US policy toward Iran is how do you reconcile this paradox of the Iranian state and society of uh, a regime which we're trying to prevent from becoming like North Korea and a society, an Iranian society, which really aspires to be like South Korea. And mm -hmm. this is a challenge because to try to prevent Iran from becoming like North Korea has required economic and political isolation. But to try to help Iranian society become like South Korea requires more political and economic engagement and integration. And so I think we have to think more creatively how we reconcile these you know, potentially uh, competing impulses. Fascinating as always. Okay, shall we just take it from here with uh, uh, Karim Sajapur and we all engage in the same conversation? Let me stay with you, Karim Sajapur. Uh, well, yeah, you said they made the decision. You're talking about the Biden administration that they would go first, the priority would be for the return to the nuclear deal. Uh, and. You, you somehow framed it in a way that one should worry about it because of uh, going there first and losing the leverage. Is this what you meant to say? Is this a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Why are you sure that they have made up their minds and why did they make up their minds in this direction? Karim Sajarpur? Yeah, well, first, uh, Tom Friedman has a column today, uh, which is an interview with President Biden, uh, President-elect Biden, in which he ah. talked about um, the fact that their priority is to return to the nuclear deal. Let me, let me frame for you the, the decision as, as I see it. Um, you know, essentially uh, a Biden administration is inheriting um, a pandemic and all the uh, crises, economic challenges associated with that pandemic. And my view is their instinct is that they don't want to begin the presidency with an escalatory uh, crisis with Iran. And their belief is that if they try to use the leverage, the pressure, the sanctions they're inheriting from the Trump administration to try to squeeze more concessions out of Iran, Iran's reaction will not be to simply uh, acquiesce and submit to that pressure. They're going to counter escalate. And 
that's not something that Biden wants to begin his presidency with. So, so the big uh, the decision is, do you want to begin your presidency with an escalatory crisis with Iran, or do you want to delay uh, the escalatory crisis with Iran, which is likely to happen down the road? And I think they're choosing option A. Uh, Tom Fletcher, I, uh, you have served as an ambassador here to Lebanon, where I am, and do you know what that means in terms of the impact of the Iranian policies on the region, uh, on countries like Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen? And so if this sequence is, is correct, which I'm sure that uh, Karim Sanjarpur is telling us that uh, exactly he reads it very well, and he really is telling us that uh, the sequencing is very clear. Uh, so what does that translate into in terms of regional behavior, malign regional behavior, and also the missiles? Tom Fletcher, your view on these matters. Well, I think the, the change of tone uh, in itself will be important for the Middle East, that will be out of this sort of phase of, of pinball diplomacy and back into a phase of more patient diplomacy. Um, that America will, will stop being the kind of country it used to try to fix uh, and go back out there and start trying to, uh, to make the situation better. Look, the, the logic was always, wasn't it, in the first phase, we can't do everything. We said we cannot do a kind of grand bargain regional deal with Iran. So better that we pick out one bit of it that we might potentially be able to get done and then hopefully create the climate for the rest. Now, clearly, because of uh, Trump coming along in the middle of that and vandalizing uh, the agreement, that, that wasn't possible. Um, I, think, I think what we need to, to see, really, from the Biden administration, I agree with Karine, is, is something that is more reassuring and boring uh, in their approach, uh, is this much, much calmer, more stabilizing tone. Um, I, do think, uh, I do think that they will focus on, on putting back the bits of it which they feel are easiest to fix, and the nuclear framework is, uh, you know, um, in a, among a very difficult set of challenges is, is easier than most. But I don't think they'll be able to delay that second part for very long, uh, partly because America's regional allies will demand that they make much faster progress uh, on those other issues, partly because at the time of the Iran deal, many of those who are cu currently coming back into the administration knew that by this stage they'd have to be dealing with Iran's wider behavior in Yemen, in Syria, in Lebanon, uh, and so on. They never felt that it could be put off for longer than this. So I think we will see them moving back onto that agenda faster, um, but they probably need to find a way to be starting those conversations in quite a, a quiet, patient way, and not, not making a rush for that Nobel Peace Prize in the first year. Wait, we've been there, done that. I mean, when everybody agreed that uh, they would put away the regional behavior, now we have the miss precision missiles uh, being manufactured all over these uh, proxy places. And, and you know, it's easier for you guys sitting in, at Oxford and in uh, DC and uh, uh, not, not in Istanbul, uh, but uh, definitely in New York to just say, oh, well, you know, the grand bargain is not attainable now. Well, let's take it easy. Well, you know, to see the impact of erasing the leverage on parts of the Arab region, of the geography of the Arab region, it, it's not our priority here that you, we worry about your concern about the nuclear. Mm -hmm. Our priority is really about the regional and your agreements where we get, uh, you no know, hurt to say, to put it mildly. Tom, I'm going to give you the chance to answer. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I don't think um, uh, the nuclear deal was about erasing leverage. And I don't think also anybody was going around saying this will immediately mean that Iran will start behaving well all over the place. Um, in some ways, it gives us more leverage and that it, draw, it, it took that, it took the, the nuclear threat off the table, not just for us, but yeah. Uh, but for the region as well. But yeah, yeah, absolutely, I agree that it's much easier to say that sat in the UK than it is sat in, in Beirut as I was for the, for four years. Now, my, sorry, just to clarify, the leverage, I mean the sanctions. When you start off by just saying, I'm going to resume the new, new, new JCPOA and just erase that sanctions leverage, then how are you going to get back and demand anything from Iran on its uh, you know regional behavior? Because you know, President Obama said, okay, that's gonna impact their behavior. And it didn't. In fact, it accelerated with the money they got. That's, can, one more time to you, Tom, because I just don't yeah, want to- I think, I think that, you know, there are currently massive sanctions um, on the table. And I, I, I completely agree with Karim about this point about Iran being in a situation now where it has to choose between pride and its economy. 
Uh, and so the sanctions are clearly going to be a part of that. By the way, uh, that framing, Korean's framing there, equally applies to Britain's negotiations with the EU, to Australia's negotiations now uh, with China, to Russia's negotiations um, with the world. It's, it's quite interesting that a number of countries now are having to choose between pride and their economy. And pride used to pay much better in the 20th century. But coming back to Asla's point about soft power, now being more magnetic as a country is what actually pays. And so more of these countries, hopefully, eventually, one day, including Iran, will realize that actually that sort of hard power view of the world is not working out for them compared to uh, the approach of being more magnetic. Yeah, I just uh, want to tell you, Tom Fletcher, uh, both pride and economy have been absolutely stepped on in this country where you once served. Both are down the drain and the, the reasons are quite clear for anybody to see. So think about that when I get back to you, because I really want to see what do you do about the smaller countries who are being trampled on? I want to understand that. It's not good enough that Biden's people decided that suits me fine. What do you do for the others? Vance Sirchuk, you're the American here, other than me. Go ahead. Look, I think Kareem too. So uh, we're, we're, we- I mean, I'm Kareem too. Sorry, sorry, excuse me. I just, I'm, I'm, I was very much into this uh, Biden thing. Go ahead, Karim made trouble. Yalla, let's go. <laughs> no, so look, I mean, let me let me just make a couple of observations on this. I mean, first, you know, there, and I, I, I take Tom's point and uh, about um, you know the need to recognize that in the 21st century, um, what what counts is the ability to uh, to attract others to your side. But you know, this is also the argument that in the long run, all of us are going to be dead. In the here and now, hard power does actually matter quite a bit. And you know, as we saw in the aftermath of Russia moving into uh, to Ukraine in 2014, it's all well and good to say, well, you're behaving like a 19th century power in the 21st century and you don't get it. But the reality is for people on the ground, when you have countries that are behaving with military force and with hard power, it actually has real human consequences. We've seen that in the Middle East with the way that Iran has behaved. We've seen that around Rus Russia's periphery. We see this in the way that China is behaving towards many of, uh, many of its neighbors as well. So I, I, I wouldn't discount the importance of hard power. Um, I wouldn't discount the importance of the balance of power. Um, these things still matter uh, every bit as much in the 21st century as they did in the 20th and the 19th century. Second, you know, to, to Kareem's point, and I, I agree with him that the initial instinct um, is likely to be, let's try to find a way to de-escalate with, with Iran but that can take a number of different forms. That doesn't necessarily mean let's go back to the JCPOA as it existed in 2015. I, I'm personally fairly skeptical that that, that is going to be um, the approach or that that's even achievable. Um, we're in 2020 now, we'll soon be in 2021. Uh, the world is very different. The other reality is that even if you say, let's put aside the question of human rights, let's put aside the regional behavior, let's put aside the missiles, you know, the, the basic, critique of the JCPOA with respect to the sunset clauses um, has much more resonance today than it did in 2015. We're a lot closer to these deadlines beginning to have real implications. So I, I think what might be more likely is to try to find a way to lower the, the, the temperature a bit with Iran. Think about the JPOA of 2013, for instance some sort of limited freeze for freeze where neither side completely gives up the leverage that it's built up and then an opening for a long, longer, larger conversation. Um, now what form that takes and oh, by the way, whether the Iranians decide to go along for the conversation is another matter. Um, I think one of the consistent things that we've seen over the years is never underestimate the ability also of the Iranian government uh, to potentially sabotage its own best options along the way. Um, and given the politics that are playing out in Iran, and I looked at Karim here as the, the real expert, obviously going into the elections that they're going to be having next year, yeah. I, I think there's a real question about how much um, flexibility um, and creativity there's likely to be on the Iranian side, irrespective of what the instincts and desires coming out of Washington are. Yeah, uh, Karim, I'm going to get back. You, you want to have two fingers before I go to Asla on this one, Karim? I just want to say that I, I agree 100% with what Van said. What I was describing was what I thought um, Biden administration's impulses are. But if I had to, um, you know, lay out what I thought would be the best framework, I think what what what, what Vance articulated makes a lot of sense. Um, Bradley, I want to add a, a, a couple other things, which is on your concerns, very valid concerns of 
smaller countries, whether that's Lebanon or Gulf countries or Israel about Iran's its, its missiles and drones. Um, you know, I think that one of the challenges the Biden administration is going to have to face is that um, it wants to do, it wants, you know, there's almost a bipartisan consensus in the United States for America to, um, to reduce its footprint, its presence in mm -hmm. the Middle East. But if you want to do that, that means you're going to have to rely more, not less, on your regional partners. And this is going to be a challenge given the hostility within the Democratic Party uh, against you know, Netanyahu's Israel, against Mohammed bin Salman's Saudi Arabia, against the UAE. So you know, whether we like it or not, if we want to reduce our presence in the Middle East, we, we cannot downgrade those partnerships. The second point I'd say is that my, my view is that over the years, um, you know, the JCPOA was essentially a half solution. Instead of totally, um, you know, uh, eliminating Iran's nuclear program, it was a five out of ten solution. Mm -hmm. When I when I look at um, U.S. policy towards Iran in the region, my view is that we've sought ten out of ten solutions, which is you know, Iran get out, or and and, and like likewise, uh, you know, regional countries. The the if you ask. Um, you know, Saudi officials will say, okay, Iran, get out of the Arab world, stop supporting Hezbollah, stop supporting Bashar Assad. These are all um, very desirable goals. But my view is that uh, instead of getting that 10 out of 10, we've always gotten zero out of 10. And so I think we have to start thinking about what are five out of 10 policies um, like the JCPOA framework, which would apply to Iran's role in the region. How do we uh, limit Iranian influence? How do we interdict um, their weapons shipments to groups like Houthis? How do we expose what they're doing in the support of, of Assad and Hezbollah and others? Because I think that um, it's actually quite problematic, those policies in the Iranian domestic context. And we've heard quite frequently when there are anti-government protests in Iran, the slogans people chanting is forget about Syria, think about us. Forget about Hezbollah, think about us. I think we need to do a better job of, you know, the, the acronym I use is LIE. It's limit, interdict, and expose Iran's regional policies. And, and very interesting. I'm sure that I will have reaction to that from both Tom and Vance, but I want to first go to Asla uh, because, well, uh, first, uh, if you want to comment on what Karim said, please feel free. But I also want you to kindly take me where a Turkish individual uh, would be thinking about listening to this conversation about the Biden administration and Iran. I know we will talk about Turkey on its own because I want to go, I want to stay with you for a couple more extra minutes, but can you just explain to me the dynamics here from your point of view, as if, if you know, for the Biden administration doing what we understand it's doing now uh, in its relationship with Iran. Go ahead, Asla. Turkey had this a strange uh, situation when it comes to Iran and the nuclear program in the sense that it was always worried about Iran's nuclear program, but was not one of the countries that came out and said so. Uh, in other words, there was such a careful attitude towards Iran. This is a border that has not changed since uh, 1639 and the two countries the, the, the reason the border has not changed is because there is a policy of non-intervention and there is a very a policy of going around each other's issues very gingerly. Uh, so I think that Ankara has been worried about Iran, uh, has looked at JCPO, has looked at the nuclear deal under Obama administration with some optimism, but then was very discouraged by Iran's activism in Syria. And don't forget that last February, Iran-backed uh, groups were fighting Turkey-backed backed groups in Idlib. In fact, Iran-backed groups were fighting Turkish forces, Turkish military directly in Idlib. So That's there right. is no love lost there. And there is certainly a great deal of anxiety. But nonetheless, Turkey is not going to be one of these countries that come out and say it so openly. I think there is some, uh, and this is, 
sort of the popular sentiment. There is some hope that there will be a return to nuclear negotiations in order to curb Iran's nuclear ambitions. But also, and of course, Turkey is a trading nation, a desire for trade uh, to, with Iran, but also very cautious approach when it comes to Iran. Right. So, no, I don't think anyone is saying don't go back to the negotiating table when, uh, uh, in the, so that to, you revisit the JCPOA and then you improve it. And you, I think the argument here is about putting aside the other concerns as happened before, which Iran, is regional. And yeah, go ahead. Iran has been part of the problem in Syria, no doubt. And I think that uh, we have experienced it not just in Idlib, but in other parts of Syria as well. So that is the prism through which Turkey will look at uh, you know, upcoming nuclear negotiations. How, what is the impact on Syria? What is the impact on Iran-backed groups? What is the impact on Idlib specifically? That's what, okay, stay with me, uh, Asla, because I want to, uh, you know, let's talk about the fact that Turkey also has proxy armies, uh, or in fact, it's accused of creating jihadists in Syria as well. It's not only Iranian intervention. So what do you propose or what do you project will be going on uh, now that the Biden administration could be taking the uh, pressure off Iran? Throw the picture for me in Syria. First of all, I think a Russian American dialogue will be very important. And I do hope that there will be a substantial conversation about Syria, because part of the reason we've not had any movement over the past four years is because we've not had any real uh, sort of a sincere commitment in that direction. We've not had any substantial talk. It does not have to be a, a, a complete reset, but there needs to be a, a direct negotiation when it comes to Syria. And I think second point is we in the international community have to make a decision. Do we like the status quo? If so, we continue with the same game that we're playing at the UN and this committee and that, but Syrians end up suffer. Or are we going to think of a more substantial policy in which we support Syrian society? I'm not talking about normalization with the Assad regime, but as it is, we are neither reaching out to the regime nor to the Syrian society. Some type of uh, reconstruction of this country has to start. And I think there have to be avenues for that. Mm. And that is going to be very important because okay. we've all played a role in its decline. Mm. And the similarities yet again, uh, you know, exporting uh, paramilitary forces or building them, it's, it's a common denominator in the in doctrine, if you will, right now between Turkey and uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran. And yet, and we know where is the arena for that. I mean, take a look at what uh, Turkey doing in, in Libya and, and, uh, and not only in Syria. Uh, I'm not gonna go into you know, the relationship with the Europeans right now because that would consume too much time. But you know, I, this is to all of you, uh, starting with Asla, what does that, you know, why is it okay for us and we, the, the people in the Arab region to live with that, Asla? Well, I, I just want to talk about the point you made, the presence of Turkey-backed groups. This is, this is a point of discussion in Turkey. There is a great controversy about that. Uh, you think you're doing uh, something for your own national security, but what type of a national security are we talking about? In other words, sealing off the Turkish border with jihadist groups is not necessarily going to make Turkey safer. It presumes a certain kind of Turkey, but that's not the kind of Turkey we've all subscribed to. So I think there is a very lively debate on this in Turkey, a sort of a controversy about the types of some of the groups, not all, they're not all jihadists, and but really, but a real controversy about some of the groups that we are supporting. Uh, and there has to be at some point a sincere conversation in this country. When are we going to normalize with the Kurdish population in our part of the world, in, in our own geography? They, why are they less of our neighbors than these groups that we don't know about that, that, that are now sealing over our borders? And when do we and when do we synchronize the demands of our society here in Turkey with our foreign policy? 
Uh, I want to take that to Van Serchuk and then Tom Fletcher. I, I, we have a lot on, on the plate right now. I'm sure you've been wanting to come in and say what you want to say. Let me not bombard you with more questions. Go ahead, Van Serchuk. No, just, about... just listening to, uh, to your question, Regita, and, and also to Asla, I'm, I'm reminded of, um, there's a, a line by Oscar Wilde that there are two kinds of tragedy in life. The first is not getting what you want. The second is getting it. Um, and, you know, for, for so many years, the United States um, foreign policy community has said, if only um, we could uh, step back from the Middle East and others in the region step up and start assuming more responsibility for their own security. Well, look around the region today. You have Turkey, you have Iran, you have UAE, you have Saudi Arabia, you have Israel, all of these countries are stepping up. Um, the Israelis um, <coughs> consistent with, I think, the, the kind of approach that they've historically taken. But in the case of Turkey, in the case of the Emirates, in the case of Saudi, um, really over the last five years in ways that are historically unprecedented, um, trying to define uh, the region uh, in ways that are consistent with their security, trying to uh, develop capabilities, indigenous capabilities to project power in ways that they historically haven't. The result, needless to say, uh, has not been, however, uh, peace and prosperity for the region. It's been the intensification of the struggle across the region in multiple different places uh, for, for power and influence among these countries. So I think that the basic paradox that we in the United States have to confront is the one that, that Kareem alluded to. You know, on the one hand, we can say, listen, um, we have to step back and um, focus elsewhere in the world because our vital national interests require us to, to be focused elsewhere, foremost in Asia. And we're gonna have less resources, less diplomatic bandwidth to focus on the Middle East. And therefore we're gonna have to rely on our friends more. Uh, and they're gonna come to conclusions that may not be consistent with our values and our interests. Or we have to say, actually the outcome of that is not something that we like that it is inconsistent with the kind of region that we want and that's inconsistent with our national interests and therefore take a different approach. Right now, what we've essentially done is assume we can do less and get better results. That is a fallacy. And the region is dealing with the consequences, the very bloody and, and tragic consequences of that fallacy. But, but you know, the, the in the roles that set that so many different roles of the United States in this region and of the UK for that matter have not always been so constructive. I mean, the making of, uh, of, of extremism, there has been a, an actual hand in that, whether it is for, uh, you know, cre creating the possibility for Iran to become uh, a place where religion is imposed on state or for Turkey to have the project of the Muslim Brotherhood. N none, of, none of this has come without an American contribution one way or another. And that's what the Obama Biden administration did in their support for the Muslim Brotherhood's rise in Syria. I mean, and yes, in Syria as well, but in Tunisia, in Egypt. So, you know, playing innocent and we're not interested and, you know, maybe you're gonna rise up to the occasion is nice, okay, but the damage that has been done by interference by, of the outside is tremendous, Vance. Yeah, so Regita, I think that the argument that you're articulating is one that you'll hear also from many people in the United States. And it's the counter to exactly what I've just said, which is, look, Look at Iraq, look at Afghanistan. When the United States tries to do things in the Middle East, the result is calamity. So therefore, why bother to try at all? Okay. Better to step back and let the chips fall where they may. Okay. Um, my, my own view on this personally is that um, the fact that we have made um, catastrophic mistakes in the region is something that we have to face squarely. Um, but that the fact that we have stumbled, the fact that we have failed, does not therefore mean we should not try and engage. And yeah. that we also have to be equally realistic that if we do step back, that is also not a magical solution to the problems of the region. It simply creates new and more complicating ones for us to have to then, okay. uh, that ultimately are gonna confront us in one form or another. 
Okay, uh, Tom Fletcher, uh, and please go right ahead and tell me kindly that grand bargain that you spoke about in one of your uh, six points, I think. Is this what may be happening right now between the Biden administration and Iran? Uh, is this uh, where the Europeans are coming in? Uh, how? What do you? What you know? What do you do about? Uh, the, the cycle of revenge or the potential of revenging for, for, for the two very important men who have been killed in uh, 2020, in, in, in the Iranian leaders of, of the regime, if you will. So just because you're afraid of revenge, do you go ahead and sell the store? What is this? Is this a grand bargain in the making? Or is this just like, you know, you know duck for the time being? Tom Fletcher. Uh, so, frankly, I don't think we're anywhere close to um, anything that could be described as um, a grand bargain, M mainly because of those reasons that Vance just described, that you ha you have a, a, in the Biden team a group of foreign, foreign policy operators who are not activists by their nature. They're very cautious, and they're cautious not just because of Iraq and Afghanistan. And we, you know, we saw the effects of that and the inability to intervene in the end over, over Syria, um, despite, in that case, many of them having the, the instincts that they wanted to. But that caution actually goes back and because of the age of some of the those involved it's actually about vietnam and the legacy of, of vietnam as well but this sense that if you if you intervene out there the world bites you back if you don't intervene the world bites you back if you sort of oscillate between those two positions the world bites you back anyway so at least the starting point has to therefore be how do we ensure we do no harm how do we ensure that we don't make things inadvertently worse by stumbling around clumsily and you describe some of the ways that the, the region perceives that i think as well people around biden would say that they would get frustrated by you know they they, they would struggle to work out is is this one of the periods when we're complaining there's too much u.s interference engagement or no. there's not enough you know which one which one are we complaining about this week because you know it, that's all part of that same formula. So I think much more they will they will look, I mean, it's a three, three particular angles. One is that in the meantime, you don't get anywhere close to your grand bargain uh, if you give away some of those means that you have to penalize Iran for bad behavior, particularly in Lebanon and Syria, in my experience. You've got to keep some of those penalties uh, on the table. You can't just sort of trade those in somehow before the conversation has got anywhere. You need a second strand to this, which is that you need to find ways to encourage the Saudis and the Iranians to at least start to talk about some of the friction points around the edges of their relationship. It's proved very easy and, and quick and uh, swift for the Gulf to have that sort of creative conversation uh, with Israel, effectively jettisoning um, half of the Arab Peace Initiative, but keeping on the table the normalization. And it's a positive conversation to be uh, to be having, you know, where where will we see that same creativity with uh, with Iran? And then there is a third angle to this, which has to be a more central role for all its weaknesses with the UN for the, for the UN Security Council, and that includes bringing Russia into that conversation. Well, okay, I am going to be um, uh, losing. I mean, it's time that I should start to give to give you two minutes for conclusion. But I want to go first to Karim Sajjarpour and Karim at the very end of saying. Uh, whether, whether you think it is that uh, fear of revenge and the cycle of venge uh, avenging for uh, people who are assassinated uh, or killed, is this what's driving the Biden administration to say right now, well, give me, you know, the de-escalation. By the way, the word de-escalation has been used by many leaders in the Arab region, including in the UAE. Nobody is saying, let's escalate. But some are saying, many are saying, please don't make me your battleground. And while you pull, you know, you make your, your side deals at my at my expense. Karim Sajapur, why don't you take uh, exactly three minutes to answer this and to give me your concluding remarks. And then I go down the line for like one minute each. I think I don't have more time than that. Karim Sajapur. Um, thanks, Arida. So the first point, um, I was reading Obama's memoir, The Promised Land. And he there's a line in, in, in his memoir in which he, talks about being uh, briefed uh, about the possibility of conflict with Iran. We're talking about you know, 2010 or so when there's a US-Iran uh, escalation. And he said that he realized that if there was to be a conflict with Iran, it would upend everything else he's trying to achieve in his presidency, just as the Iraq war upended 
George W. Bush's presidency. So, so I, I think that that probably is going to be, um, you know, a strong instinct of of uh, of the Biden administration that we simply want to avoid external conflicts, whether with Iran or others, because uh, we have a lot we want to achieve domestically. Um, the, the final three points I, I'd like to make Arahi, is, is number one, in my opinion, there's virtually no chance of a grand bargain between the United States and Iran. A grand bargain was a term that was, was used by several people. Um, this is not because the United States does not want that, it's because the Iranian regime uh, its hostility towards the United States is a central part of its identity. That's and right. so continued conflict with the United States uh, is far less of an existential threat to uh, Iran than, than a rapprochement. So that's not going to happen. Mm. Um, the second point is to Vance's point uh, about um, the role of the United States in the Middle East. You know, Tony Blinken, who's going to be uh, Secretary of State, likes to frequently use a line that the world doesn't organize itself. And I think similarly, Middle Eastern conflicts don't resolve themselves. Um, I don't think anyone believes that China or Russia is going to step up and play a constructive role in helping to ameliorate the humanitarian crises in Yemen or Syria and elsewhere. So whether we like it or not, I think that only the United States can fill that vacuum. And as angry as people in the region may be with the United States, I think they probably deep down recognize that. The final point I'd like to make is that I think there's a common misperception about the sectarian conflicts in the Middle East. And that is that um, there's a view that, well, Iran is Shiite and it supports Shiite radicals and you know Saudi Arabia or Turkey or Sunni and they support their Sunni radicals. So it's essentially an equal game. And I think what's misunderstood is the huge asymmetric advantage Iran has over Sunni rivals like Saudi Arabia because of the fact that virtually all Shiite radicals are willing to go out and fight and kill for the Islamic Republic of Iran, whereas virtually all Sunni radicals like Al Qaeda and ISIS want to overthrow the government of Saudi Arabia. That's so right. there's not uh, parity there. Fascinating. And on Asla's point about Turkey's use of these Sunni radicals, uh, my view is that just as it came back to bite Saudi Arabia and others in the past, and they now recognize that Mohammed bin Salman recognizes it, um, it's, it's far more difficult for Sunni countries to harness radicalism the way that it is for Iran to harness Shia radicalism. So I'll stop there. Yes, because you know you keep fascinating us, and we want to listen more. And now I have to give everybody only thirty seconds. In, indeed, uh, I'm grateful to you, Karim, for enlightening us with your very deep uh, analysis of what's going on. Thirty seconds to Vance, uh, thirty seconds to Tom, and I want to conclude with Asla. Thirty seconds only, please. So thirty Tom. seconds. The Middle yeah. East and the world. Okay. Um, I would only say this. I think that the, um, the American instinct is often to try to overwhelm problems with superior resources, technology. One of the things that I think we see in the Middle East, though, is that um, it's not simply a question of superior resources. It's a question of ingenuity, of guile, of courage, of wherewithal. Uh, you look at the success that the Israelis have achieved in pushing back against Iran. It is not because their economy or their population is bigger than Iran. It is because they have actually applied things much more creatively, frankly, than we have. I think that there are a lot of lessons that we have to learn in how we're going to navigate the world, not just in the Middle East, more broadly from that kind of experience. Thank you very much, Van Serge, uh, Tom Fletcher. Listen, you guys, in case uh, the electricity gets cut off, stay put. That means I'm coming right back, so don't disappear. 30 seconds to you, Tom Fletcher, please. Uh, well, firstly, all of this is going to be harder for everyone, whether you're America or Iran or Turkey or the UK, because the rise of distrust, the rise of inequality and the rise of that more technological uncertainty will make it harder for anyone to govern and anyone to do uh, diplomacy. Uh, secondly, in the absence of all the other tools that we've identified, but have realized that no one is actually willing to use, the answer has to keep coming back to uh, diplomacy, but better diplomacy than we've seen so far this century. Thirdly, climate change and the migration and conflict, we haven't really touched on this, that, that it will create could dwarf everything we've discussed 
uh, today in terms of its impact on instability. And final point, in all of this, Biden's got a huge job, not just in trying to put the world right, but actually trying to put America right. There's a certain, there's, the primary job for Biden is nation therapy at home. And ultimately it may be that that is most deserving of the Nobel Peace Prize. Thank you very much, Tom uh, Fletcher. Uh, Asna, please, uh, to you. Thank you, Ragda. My final words is, I don't know about a grand deal for the Middle East, but I will say that a reset uh, is necessary in Turkey's relations with United States in general, but, but also with uh, the West in general. Uh, there are problems in NATO with the European Union and of course with Washington. And I think this Biden administration with people like Tony Blinken who know Turkey fairly well, there is an opportunity. It's not going to be a Turkey of the 90s. It is going to have ambitions that are bigger. It feels that there is already a great, uh, the age of great power competition, but there is what we knew, we do need a more functional relationship. Secondly, Turkey needs to return to good neighborly relations, good relations with its neighbors. There is no other way because what looks like might from outside is actually, translating as a vulnerability domestically. And finally, as a third point, I'll just say one sentence, I've not given up on Turkish democracy because this is there's a long history and this is what Turkish population seems to demand reform in democracy. And sooner or later, we will have to return to that. Just a second, don't go away, go ahead. Okay, are you still with me, everybody? I hope. Is everybody still with me? We're Thank still you here. for your patience. This is what happens. This is what happens when you become a dysfunctional country, with to my regret, uh, and the reasons are internal and external. It is home, uh, home brewed, and also a contribution by the wonderful uh, outsiders who just decided that this piece of heaven on earth has got to be abused. So this is one thing you see. Uh, what what is going on is worse than what you see. Uh, so I can't thank you enough, all of you, for this amazing stellar of a session. I learned tremendously, as I always have, but this time it's taken us really to the next level, what we really need to think about and what to do about it. So with that, I thank you all of you for joining me and I wanna announce who are my guests for the e-policy circle number 26 of Beirut Institute Summit in Abu Dhabi. And that is next Wednesday. We have uh, His Excellency Ayad Alawi, former vice president and former prime minister of Iraq. We have General Joseph Botel, former commander of US Central Command and of the US Special Operations Command. We have uh, His Excellency Philip Ackerman, director general of the German Federal of uh, Foreign Office. And we have Nouriel Rubini, who is, of course, as you all know, professor of economics at NYU's Stern School of Business and the chairman of Rubini Marco Associates, Macro Associates, excuse me. I thank you for inviting us. I thank you for your input. Stay, stay in touch. And hopefully we will be seeing you next year at uh, the fourth edition of Beirut Institute Summit in Abu Dhabi. But in the meantime, I pray that you agree to uh, another invitation I will have in mind for you in 2021. Uh, we are in the month of holidays. May you have great holidays and peace of mind and may, be, and may you always be blessed. Goodbye for now. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.